When I say black, what are some of the first things you think of? Don't be shy. Poverty. And don't give me politically correct answers. Poverty. What else? Violence. Violence. What else? Savage. Savage. Aggression. What else? Pardon? Aggression. Aggression. Uneducated. Uneducated. No. Ghetto. Presenting Africa as a place with no history or culture was one way that European nations justified slavery. Africa's history did not begin with slavery, and nor does it end there. Despite the existence of great African civilizations, some Europeans insisted that Africans were inferior. This is a legacy that continues today. They found themselves in foreign lands across the Atlantic, separated from their families and forced to work. It is not known exactly how many African people died in enslavement, but the numbers range between 12 and 100 million people. In Britain, the physical legacies of the slavery business are all around us. The selling and export of slave-produced commodities created enormous wealth for the British plantation owners, merchants, financiers, insurers and the government. The system of slavery contributed towards Britain becoming an industrialised nation and helped to shape the physical, cultural and economic landscape we see today. When we talk about Britain and slavery, what we're talking about is the colonial empire that Britain built. Slavery was a system put in place thousands of miles away. It was put in place by all the European powers in the Americas, both in South America and in North America and in Central America. And as Britain joined that expansion, it came very late to the business of slavery, but very enthusiastically. Africa's rich natural resources, including the gold and silver of the Gambia, started to entice European nations to the region. In 1672, the Royal African Company was awarded a charter by King Charles II. The charter gave the company sole rights to control English trade with West Africa. The company, with the help of local traders, were also involved in the buying and selling of Africa's most precious resource, its people. Sir John Cass was a director of the Royal African Company between 1705 and 1708. He corresponded with the slave forts in Africa and traders in the Caribbean, and he also had shares in the company. Sir John lived in South Hackney. In the 1700s, Hackney was a semi-rural place with fields, farms and large country houses. Rich merchants started to move there, as it was only a short ride away from the city. Cass was a wealthy and powerful man. He was an older man and a sheriff, and later a member of parliament. John Cass has left a legacy in London. Before he died, he set up a charitable institution for educating the poor. University buildings are named after him. In Hackney, his legacy is remembered in our streets. In the 1700s, and when slavery was at its peak, Hackney was home to many a wealthy West India merchant. At the same time, the area was becoming known as a centre for religious non-conformists, or dissenters, and intellectuals with radical ideas. The Boddingtons were three generations of merchants, and they formed a trading partnership called Boddington & Co. They were absentee planters, owning and investing in sugar plantations in the Caribbean without living there. They lived in Clapton. The senior Boddingtons held positions as directors of the Bank of England and the South Sea Company, and were members of the pro-slavery lobby. But they were also supporters and later governors of a dissenting academy, New College, at Hackney. They were members of the non-conformist Unitarian Church, which at the time was home to a number of outspoken anti-slavery activists. Life was brutal for enslaved people. They were stripped of their names and culture, whipped, tortured and humiliated. It wasn't uncommon for Africans to be murdered on the plantations. But African people resisted from the very moment they were stolen. On the ships there were mutinies, suicides and rebellions. In the French colony of Haiti in 1791, under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture, the enslaved rose up and seized their freedom. In 1822, a Baptist priest named Thomas Birchall travelled to Jamaica and set up a church. The 
those days, slaves weren't supposed to be allowed to read, and read or write. But I have a feeling that Thomas Burchell would have been able to help Samuel Sharp to read and to write. The white man has no more right to hold the blacks in bondage than the blacks have to enslave the whites. So Thomas Burchell would have been talking to Samuel Sharp and telling him what's going on um, in England, the discussions about slavery and the ending of it. So that's what really pushed Sam, Sam Sharp into saying, well, look, we must have a different um, way of life for all the people. So what Sam Sharp did, he told his friends that they should stop working on that day, the day after um, Christmas, and then demand wages. That was the first start of emancipation. But when the time did come, um, and they sat down, that was like a, sat, a sit down strike, a, a sit down strike, that was one of the first sit down strikes. They felt, well, they weren't going to work. And eventually, um, the troops came, or these uh, ruffians came, and demanded that the Africans went back to work without pay. You see, and then there was a scuffle, and eventually it turned into a riot, then turned into a rebellion. And that rebellion um, involved something like 70,000 African people, men and women. Did not Mr. Birchill tell you to rebel? No, he did not. Tell me the truth. Confess that he did so, or I will blow your brains out. They always assumed that the Africans really were dumb and they didn't know what was going on. And it was a Baptist who was actually stirring it up. Negroes, you have taken up arms against your masters and burnt and plundered their dwellings. Some wicked persons have told you that the king has made you free. In the name of the king, I come among you to tell you that you have been misled. I come with numerous forces to punish the guilty. And those found with the rebels will be put to death without mercy. I would rather die upon yonder gallows than live in slavery. That was an important rebellion. That rebellion really pushed the arm of the British government to abolish uh, slavery. The British public became more aware of the reality of life for enslaved men and women when the writings of formerly enslaved people were published and promoted around the country. The MP William Wilberforce is only one part of the story of abolition. Free people of colour and the British public ordinary men and women also campaigned to end enslavement in the colonies. It didn't matter that they, many of them at that time, middle class women, didn't actually have jobs outside the home um, and they weren't allowed to take part in parliament or in um, public life. Um, they were actually taking a political issue, um, the existence of colonial slavery and the suffering of people under slavery and trying to bring it home to ordinary people in their homes and say, you can do something about this. You don't have to rely on the men in Parliament. Moved to action by this knowledge, women and children got organised and boycotted the commodity that was lining the pockets of many, sugar. So what you have to imagine is if you went into one of these households where you have really dedicated anti-slavery campaigners, you might find that they actually have a special um, tea service so that people would actually be um, kind of perhaps asking their friends round to tea and then using the tea service as a kind of conversation piece. In the congregation at Newington Green were many prominent women who campaigned fiercely for abolition. One was the early feminist, Mary Wollstonecraft, and the other was Anna Letitia Barbold. Both lived and worked in Hackney. She used her poetry uh, quite often for political ends. Um, and in 1791, she actually wrote a poem called An Epistle to William Wilberforce. 
Um, and this was expressing her support for him and her despair that Parliament had yet again failed to abolish the slave trade. And it seems very likely that she participated in the sugar boycott because if you go to Hackney Archives, there's a wonderful collection of letters there, um, co original correspondence. And there's one letter where her brother says, oh, everybody else in the family has become an anti-saccharite. I realise I can't hold out any longer. I'm going to stop using sugar as well. Anna Letitia's memory is also etched into Hackney's landscape. The act to end slavery in the British colonies became law in 1834. So why did it take another four years for the enslaved to be free? So it's a, it's a challenge of political economy for, the, for the, the state. And what the state does is to uh, put together a package that spreads the cost of emancipation amongst the people who can pay. Uh, one of the people who can pay is the taxpayer in Britain. Uh, the other people who can pay are the slave owners. And the third people who can pay, oddly enough, are the enslaved people themselves. And they did this by enduring a further four-year period of apprenticeship, working for nothing for 45 hours a week until 1838. Slave owners were not happy about the loss of the people they claimed to own, their property. They demanded financial compensation. The state uh, paid £20 million in compensation to the slave owners. Back then, this was 40% of government expenditure. And depending on the way you measure it today, this amounts to numbers ranging from 1.6 billion to 200 billion pounds. You can search and discover the compensation records on UCL's database. There were 46 people with links to Hackney who made claims. One was a woman, Anna Maria Lucas of Navarino Road, who with her brothers and sisters were heirs to their father's fortune beneficiaries of large sums of money, paid for the loss of 1,121 enslaved people. A handful of abolitionists did say consistently, we're paying the wrong people. We shouldn't be paying the slave owners, we should be paying the enslaved. But that was a, a minority view, a distinctly minority view. The reparations movement is essentially a movement to repair damage and reclaim that which has been taken or stolen. When people are kidnapped and trafficked and basically taken away from their homeland, uh, many Africans resisted. They didn't just resign themselves to slavery. And so much of the slave resistance that has kind of been looked at just in terms of resistance were actually attempts to assert one's humanity, um, assert one's dignity. And so we say the movement first began in Africa. Some of the earliest sort of records of, of those arguments that we can find go back to the 18th century, and in particular with the work of an enslaved African, formerly enslaved African, Kwabna, Otoba Kugwano. He basically makes the argument that enslaved Africans had the right to restitution. Now the term restitution, as it was used then and as it is used now, is an aspect of reparation. It means to reclaim. It means to be put back in the position that one would be in had enslavement and colonisation not occurred. And so it was about having one's freedom, 